how it happened. So. All right. Hello, everybody in Leander ISD. Good afternoon. Um, we're here for our third of three webinars um, as we've been gearing up for Launch to Learning, the start of the 2020-21 school year. Um, today, I am joined um, virtually by some members of our Leander ISD leadership team. I'm Corey. I'm the Chief Communications Officer in Leander ISD. Um, we hope to answer as many questions as you may have. Um, we know that we are not going to be, answer every, be able to answer every question that you have. But we still want you to keep asking. We want you to keep engaging with us and um, keep asking the tough questions and we will be responding. Uh, we have an update for on Launch to Learning coming out today. Um, the main element of that, I posted the link in the chat. Um, it is to the FAQ um, that we've launched. It's our first edition, our first pass at our frequently asked questions. So please take a look at that. Um, and we will be updating that at least twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays from the, in the month of July for sure. We'll be sending updates to our families as we continue to gear up for the start of the school year. Um, right now, August 13th, start of school and we're ready to we're ready to rock and roll as best as we can for kids uh, given the services that we have. I'm gonna jump into some slides. Um, I posted the link to those slides as well um, for y'all to, to view and to follow along. And we're gonna ask you to use the Q&A tool um, to submit your questions. We're gonna try to answer as many questions in the presentation just for efficiency's sake. And um, we've had thousands of emails and comments and things come our way. Um, and we feel like that's a good opportunity to um, get us started, get us moving. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and do all that. Thank y'all for joining us um, in the spring. And it, it's, it's, you know, I think in April, nobody thought July was going to feel like that. And I think now many of us are feeling that stress that we were feeling in April. So again, thank you for being here with us and, and sharing your time. And we hope to provide some comfort with some information. Um, I'd first just like to let you all know that we have closed captioning. Um, Necesitas escuchar esto en español. Has click en botón de interpretación y selección silenciar el audio original. Um, for the Spanish translation, um, Isabel Caballeros is on here. She's putting some Spanish in the chat as well. Um, and she speaks Spanish way better than what I just read. So please go ahead and toggle and click that button if you need that in, in Spanish. Um, We've had a lot of feedback. We've had a lot of comments, a lot of questions, a lot of input coming in. Um, we released a survey, as you may know, um, last week, um, and that went out to all of our families. Um, that survey closed earlier this week and partially is because you'll hear today um, some of the, the recent rule changes and new regulations that came out from the state um, forced us to, to modify some of our plans and what we were moving towards. Um, in addition to that, it, it's important to know the way we've been using particularly that survey and the staff survey we have right now is to collect some baseline data for some expectations going in to the fall or going into August. Um, but the actual request of an accommodation or application, so for parents, you know, you're, you're gonna hear a lot. You've probably read about two choices families are going to be able to have when it comes to their child's schooling. Um, this coming year. Um, there's going to have to be a selection process. Uh, the survey was not that. And we'll release that selection process here in July. And again, uh, due to the sheer volume of questions, we want you to keep asking, keep pushing us. Know that the members of our leadership team, the people in this room, and so many more are reading them. Um, we're trying to respond um, individually as much as we can, but that frequently asked questions document that we're updating regularly is going to be the best place to collect information. And with that, I'd like to present, we have our, our superintendent. We're all taking a break from um, an amazing first graduation ceremony for the class of 2020 for Cedar Park High School. And you can see beautiful Gupton Stadium behind me. Um, and Dr. Gehring was in the full regalia, sweating it. Bruce, you wanna take, take it away, share something with our families as we continue to plan for 2020-21. Thank you, Corey. I appreciate it. And good afternoon, Leander ISD. Uh, it's so great to be with you this afternoon. Um, we thank you for taking the time to, to share this webinar with us and take some time to listen to 
um, answers to as many of the questions as we can get. Um, and then um, your patience and understanding with us is greatly appreciated. Uh, these are very challenging times and rapidly changing times. And so we really appreciate the fact that you understand that um, and understand that we, we have the best interest of your student um, at our heart. We want to keep uh, your students safe. We want to keep your family safe because we're keeping your students safe. Um, but we also have to pay attention and look after our faculty because um, without the staff in the buildings, we can't operate school. And so we're in this position of really trying to make sure that everybody involved stays safe in, in the process. Um, it is rapidly changing. We're keeping up with that as best we can. And the purpose of today's meeting is to really discuss the options and scenarios that we have right now. The next steps for Leander ISD is we prepare to open in the fall of 2020. Um, we're working towards in the short term um, an announcement by July 17th um, after we speak to the board on July 16th about how we're exactly going to bring faculty back in the second half of July and then how we're going to open school on August 13th. I will tell you that um, one thing for sure right now is that the calendar that the board has adopted and, and approved and is posted on our website is the calendar that we're operating off of. And so we will start school on August 13th um, and we will be following the calendar that's posted. We are paying very close attention to both the national, the state um, and our local uh, agencies, especially our public health agencies um, at, the, at the county level, but we're also listening to our mayors and our city councils and our local jurisdictions to make sure that we're connected with them um, and that we're following their guidelines, but that they also understand what it is we're doing um, so that we can have as much coordination as possible. You're going to be hearing from several of our leadership team about what we know already and about how things are going right now. Um, and then we'll walk into next steps. The most important thing is the health and safety of the people involved. And as I've said before, that's not just our students, but our parents and our families and your loved ones who may be in contact with you and your kids um, and also our faculty. We have to make sure that we have teachers in classrooms that we have custodians who can clean the buildings at the end of every day and that we have bus drivers and monitors who can help make sure that we can get everybody safely to and from school. We are listening very carefully. We really understand that everybody has voice and needs choice. And we're trying to accommodate that as much as possible. Um, so we're, we really are paying attention to the things that you're asking us and, and the comments that you're making. Um, when we take care of all the people involved, then we feel like we can offer the high quality education, the excellence in education that you've come to expect of Leander ISD and that your children deserve. And so we want to put all of those things together uh, as we work towards a great solution to start in the 2020-2021 school year. Thank you, Bruce. Um, we're going to, one of our newest members of our Leander ISD team, Dr. Devin Padable, he's an area superintendent here, um, joins us from Fort Bend ISD. He came, moved literally in the middle of this pandemic, jumped right in, and one of his main jobs in the last few weeks especially has been following the up and down of the, the state and TEA with the, the different rules and regulations and announcements that have, come up, that have come up. Dr. Padable, can you share an update with our families about where we are with TEA in the state of Texas? Absolutely. Good afternoon, Leander ISD. We had um, shared a lot of information throughout the late spring and the early summer about our plans when we did not have a lot of um, guidance and guidelines from the Texas Education Agency. Um, as guidelines came out over the course of late June, um, as the commissioner stated, we ran into the logistical impossibility of running a hybrid schedule. And I know that is an option we talked about often, this idea that students would be brought into two different sets, you know, 50% of students attending on some days and the other 50% attending on other days with kids learning at home virtually. But um, TEA does require that um, school districts offer to parents the option to come to school 100% of the time. And when we ran into that versus 100% virtual 
running hybrid in the middle of that became, as the commissioner put it, a logistical impossibility, which is why we are no longer pursuing it. And as you will research districts across the state, we are all falling into that same two options. So you know the plan. It is for us to offer 100% in person or 100% virtual. Personal protective equipment will also be distributed by the Texas Education Agency. This includes masks, face shields, gloves, hand sanitizer, and we will distribute those to different camp uh, to all of our campuses so that we have a supply for students or, and staff that need it. Um, and we will especially uh, make sure that the appropriate supplies are for the appropriate teachers. As an example, we encourage our elementary teachers to have face shields if they do not want to wear face masks because it allows them to you know give a lot of that nonverbal encouragement and affirmation to our students when the kid can see your whole face. Um, TA also did let us know that STAR will continue. That was actually one of the first decisions they made in this entire process. Uh, you may have thoughts on the appropriateness of continuing state testing when the challenges will undoubtedly be significant for kids and teachers. And if you do have those thoughts, we encourage you to reach out to your local and state legislator. There will be a virtual learning student commitment. So a lot of you probably have questions about how this works. So in the coming weeks, we're, we're gonna release an enrollment form to all families. And in this form, you will get to choose when the school year begins, do you wish for your child to be 100% in person or 100% virtual? Now, TA has said that the commitment has to be flexible up until the two weeks prior to the first day of school. And for us, that lines up to the last day in July. So parents, when you get that um, enrollment form, you actually have until the last day in July to change your mind. So you may make a selection, but you may also change your mind should your circumstances change. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Devin. We know a lot of these questions are about masks and we know that the recent mandate um, from the governor is that most people um, ages 10 and older are required to wear masks and when they cannot maintain um, the social distance. I have my mask right here for graduation here in a little bit as we get ready for um, Van to celebrate the Vandergriff High School class of 2020. Um, we have our Director of Health Services, our lead nurse, um, Kristen Wicketts. Um, Kristen, TEA has announced some updates and some guidance um, regarding public health. Um, what can you share about those updates and just general information that our families will want to know about how public health is influenced and our public health agencies are influencing our actions? Hi, everyone. This is a, a brief slide of the guidance that was provided to us by TEA. Please know that there's much more detailed plans and protocols in place that we're working on and you have access to a lot of that in the fact page that gets published when it gets published. I'm just going to go over a quick, some quick bullet points from the TEA. Um, they're giving a three-week transition option. Um, students may return to school from COVID quarantine after three fever-free days without the use of fever reducing medications and improvement of symptoms and 10 days after onset of symptoms. Um, TEA is um, they're defining close contact as within six feet for a duration of at least 15 minutes while not wearing a mask or a face shield. We're gonna to continue to follow the governor's orders in regards to face coverings, which states in, um, anybody over the age of 10 is required to wear a face mask in a public. Teachers, staff, visitors, um, they must self screen for COVID-19 symptoms before coming to campus each day and parents are gonna be required to keep symptomatic kids at home. Um, there will be notifications, contact tracing when there is a positive or a confirmed case on campus, and those will be done on a daily basis. And we'll talk about contact tracing in a slide or two after this. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. And you, you've heard in, over and over um, what choice looks like for our families, and uh, we know um, virtual will be something that a lot of our families are, are most comfortable with. Um, it's important for us to provide, provide this as a choice because we know as we deal with the public health crisis, what this, this means for families to be able to keep their, their children home. Um, but we also know in the spring, we had a recent experience with, with this virtual and remote learning 
learning that was put together in about a day to two days. Um, and we're very excited. We have some amazing teams led by our chief academic officer, Dr. Matt Bentz, who have been putting together what we're calling our virtual empowered learning program. And I'm gonna let Dr. Bentz share a little bit more about what that'll look like. All right, let's see. Okay, no video, all right. Uh, yeah, so virtual empowered learning. Um, I, Corey mentioned earlier in the presentation that we had done a lot of surveys to gather information um, on what, you know, to get feedback on different things. We got a lot of feedback from about 12,000 uh, people, teachers, parents, and students around the uh, emergency remote learning that we had set up. Um, like Corey said, uh, just, you know, in that instant when things, things uh, needed to happen. And I am really, you know, pleased with what the teachers were able to pull off. And that being said, though, um, this time around, we, we have time and we've had time and we are gathering the research on, on best practices. And we are building this newly designed virtual experience uh, based on the, on the research and what the feedback we've gotten from parents, students, and teachers. So first thing to note is that the, it is an option. There is a, it, the 100% virtual option is available for, for all students in the system. How does it look? Uh, and, and what are the things that are, are new uh, compared to what we had before? And I saw some of the questions in the Q&A and I'll attempt to answer those as we go. First thing uh, will be a consistent uh, methods for, for parent communication. We will start with a vir virtual orientation from teachers uh, given to parents and students to really um, go through what, what all the components of virtual learning are and what the expectations are uh, for the students and what you can expect um, from the experience. Second, we have built a consistent daily schedule that parents can utilize to plan around um, if they are you know, figuring out how to provide oversight, um, how to keep their kids supervised during the day. Um, one of the biggies from all three of those groups, students, staff, and parents was face-to-face -face learning. Uh, you know, they wanted that connection, that um, kind of that live streaming, that real-time uh, instruction and dialogue uh, both with, with teacher, between teacher and student and with classmates. So the other, so there will be a, a balance of that quite a bit of face-to-face -face learning in, in whole group, um, in small groups, uh, individual conferencing. There will also be from there, um, as you would get in in-person learning, independent assignments, projects, um, activities and practice. Uh, the grading system this time around will be aligned with in-person instruction. So um, along with having assignments and, and projects and things to turn in and participation in class, uh, you will be getting a numerical grade at the secondary level that will be calculated into GPA. Uh, our teachers will, will be trained to ensure the success of the implementation of this program. We have all teachers that are identified for for virtual empowered learning. Uh, we'll be going through a, a virtual teaching academy here at Leander to ensure that they're ready to rock and roll with that. Um, we students will be engaging with the learning and um, um, accessing their learning through a learning management platform. So at, at the secondary level that will continue to be Google Classroom. And um, we will be researching a more um, robust uh, learning management system and the options that we have um, as we move into 21-22. I did see one question. Well, that answers several, several of the questions, but one of the questions I saw kind of repeated a bunch of times uh, was the idea of uh, extracurriculars and co-curriculars and uh, if students would be available to participate also in some of the electives that are hands-on and don't lend themselves to, um, to a virtual environment. Uh, we will we, we have a team that met earlier today that um, is discussing which electives will lend themselves uh, best to virtual, to a virtual environment and which ones will not. For instance, some of the hands-on CTE electives, uh, hard to do virtual welding and culinary, uh, things like that. Um, also athletics, 
band, theater, dance, uh, those type of co-curricular pieces. Uh, those pieces really, uh, full participation will be um, pretty challenging in a virtual environment. So what we've um, decided and committed to is that families and students that choose 100% virtual empowered learning uh, will, however, um, talk to counselors and be able to make a decision if they want to, to attend uh, that elective or that, that athletic piece or um, those hands-on or co-curricular electives in person. Um, they would be needing to provide their own transportation. However, they could come to school um, physically for that portion um, of their learning if they wish and wanna make that decision. If they don't want to, we will have um, a, a, a list of electives available virtually that students can choose from uh, to replace that elective that re would require an, an in-person component. Uh, thanks, Corey. Thank you, Dr. Benz. Um, we, know, we also have had uh, members of our school leadership teams um, working um, on the in-person component of this. Um, Devin, Dr. Padaville, do you wanna share some updates on what in-person look like, uh, in-person learning will look like? Yes, absolutely, Corey. So this has been um, an immense uh, piece of work, but it has also been probably the most important. The safety and health of our students is our absolute number one priority. Um, so we are building safety and hygiene protocols appropriate to level, either elementary or secondary. And you know the needs of our students and teachers at those level, levels are um, uniquely different. So those protocols are being built into a handbook and are at, at this time, our elementary and middle school and high school principals are collaborating on that and providing their input so we can have um, consistent guides for classrooms and campuses to make sure that health protocols, safety protocols, and even sanitation protocols are done in such a way that protects, that really protects everyone, including our staff members. We also, in that, you'll, you will see that we, will, we are going to have defined structures for arrivals, dismissals, and transitions. Those will be consistent across the district in general terms, but they will also be unique to our buildings because all of our buildings are structured very differently. And those arrivals, dismissals, and transition structures are really intended to make sure that we don't have large groups of students congregating or clustering in the hallways as they travel to class. So really reducing the um, out of class um, contact uh, for, to protect the safety and health of our kids is, is, our, is a priority in that structure. In all of that, it is easy to see that um, school could become a very sterile and structured place that really takes away um, a lot of the things that build positive memories for kids. And that is not our intent. So our principals and our, our, our campus leaders and our district leaders are really looking at all of these health and safety protocols while still keeping compassion and community in mind. We know that for our kids, the most important program or protocol they have is just their teacher and their relationships and their classroom. And we wanna make sure those, stru those structures are in place regardless of um, the protocols we put in place to protect their health and safety. Thank you, Devin. We know that in person, a big component of keeping people safe and minimizing any spread of a virus will come down to contact tracing. Um, Kristen, again, who's our, our district nurse, our lead nurse and director of health services. Kristen, um, what can you share about what contact tracing will look like um, for our students and visitors who enter and become or report a positive test of COVID? Okay, well, of course, there's a more in-depth version of this. So this is the cliff note version. Um, I want everybody to know that there's going to be a, con, um, a COVID con um, contact tracing team at a campus level and at a district level. So there's gonna be one on every campus and that at the district level, and they'll be working and collaborating daily to do contact tracing throughout the district. Um, if an employee or a student tests positive or comes into contact at home with a COVID-19 positive person, the school um, or human resources will conduct contact tracing and notify individuals um, for, for the, 
about their 14 day quarantining if they have if they were known to come in close contact with the infected person. And that'll that'll happen on a daily basis. Again, um, TEA has defined close contact as um, within six feet of an individual for 15 minutes or more at any time without wearing a face, a face mask within 48 hours before the individual's onset of symptoms and until the individual has left school property. And we will be going through and contact tracing daily. Campus nurses on each campus will be involved in this as, long as, camp as well as campus administrators and the district team. Thank you, Kristen. Um, our director of athletics, Jody Horman, is somewhere behind me out on the field helping Vandegrift get ready for their graduation ceremony. Um, but I'll share and work with her to share a little bit about the, the, the after school activities, and that includes athletics and fine arts. Um, it's important to note, because this has been something the state left up to school districts, the virtual empowered learning um, students who are, uh, who are choosing to learn remote can still participate in fine arts and athletic groups but they'll need to provide transportation and still attend those in-classroom um, uh, classes in person. We are still allowing clubs to operate, but asking meetings to be virtual as much as possible. And the bottom two, two bullet, points, bullet points for anyone who um, is from an elementary or has an elementary school student, um, our after-school enrichment is going to be canceled for the first half of the year um, as we continue to monitor minimize the amount of visitors in our buildings and also make sure that we have um, enough time to do um, deep cleanings or thorough cleanings um, on a nightly basis. Um, we are um, going to still be offering our YMC after school care program at elementary because we know that that is something that our parents um, depend on. Um, but that also gives us a trusted partner, someone who's been working, um, a single partner, someone who has been working during the, the COVID um, crisis and pandemic and provides a, a needed service for many of our families. We have our Director of Counseling Services, Steve Clark, here as well. Um, we know that there are going to be academic uh, gaps when we come back and we know that we are a, are a learning institution um, in leading that, but we also know that students don't learn without that social and emotional support if they don't feel safe and we know learning can happen. Steve, what what, can, what will those social emotional support systems look like when we return for the 2020-21 school year? Thank you, Corey, and, and good afternoon, Leander ISD community. Um, so we know each student and family has had differing experiences during this pandemic, and we'll all return with our uh, learning experience with unique needs. Um, most students and families, they are ready to return to either the face-to-face -face or 100% virtual learning environment to continue the learning, and we know that is very important. But as Corey said, because learning is a social activity, we also know that we must address any social or emotional gaps our students have experienced, which were created by this prolonged um, isolation so that our students are prepared to fully engage in their learning process. To help our students reacclimate to school, whether it be face-to-face -face or virtual, we are creating a framework to assist our campus staff to meet these student needs. As each of our 40 plus campuses are different, we want to provide them the opportunity to create activities that will meet the needs of their specific learning community. So we know we wanna address this for all students, but we also wanna pay particular attention to our students who have transitioned to new campuses, including those that are new to district students, so those that just moved in, as well as our students who have moved from fifth to sixth and to eighth to ninth. And also during the 2020-2021 school year, all the Andrew ISD students and parents and guardian will have access to their school counselor, whether, whether they be served face-to-face -face or virtually. During the remote learning, which took place after spring break um, last year, counselors created weekly activities that were posted on the parent hub. Our counselors will continue to offer these lessons and activities for use at home, as well as providing access to the second step at home links for our pre-K through fifth grade students. Leander uh, ISD is also lucky to have licensed clinical social workers and licensed professional counselors who are part of our student and family support team. They will also continue to accept referrals during the 2020, 2021 school year for either face-to-face -face or virtual students. And these referrals are made by contacting your school counselor. So again, I say thank you and please practice self-care during these stressful times. It's so important for our caregivers to also care for themselves. 
Thank you, Steve, and thank you to the counselors um, across all of our schools. And we know now more than ever that is so needed. Um, and we also know that we have students who have different and special and individual needs. Um, we have our uh, executive director for special programs, Kimberly Waltman here as well to talk about um, our, our special ed 504 and RTI programs. Um, Kimberly, what can you share with our families? Um, hello, Leander ISD parents. Thank you for being here today um, and partnering with us as we make plans for our students in the fall. Um, there is a lot of collaboration happening between our staff and our principals, um, as well as meeting with parent groups, our curriculum team. Um, so lots of work happening behind the scenes to ensure that IEP 504 plans and RTI plans can be implemented to the fullest extent possible. One of the biggest changes that you'll see within special programs is in the spring, as we went into emergency remote learning, um, there wasn't as many opportunities for live instruction with our teachers and our related service providers. Um, want to ensure you, you know, with you that that will be happening um, for students that choose virtual learning in the fall. Of course, um, we will implement IEPs and 504 plans as written, um, both virtually and in person. Um, so you're able to make decisions that are best for your family and we're gonna work with you and collaborate with you along the way um, to be sure that we're meeting your students' needs in the best way possible. One of our biggest things is we know that for you to send your student back, you need to hear from us that your student safety is a top priority for us. And I can ensure you that our staff is working together um, to make sure that we have great systems and great protocols in place for our students and our staff to make sure that everybody's safe in their learning environment um, as they return to school. Our related services will be provided. Um, if a student chooses virtual learning, it'll be provided through synchronous learning, some teletherapy, um, just that live instruction um, will be in place for students that choose virtual learning, but also those related services will be provided as written in an IEP um, or a 504 plan um, live in person as well. One of the things that we're being very intentional about is to not lose our culture of inclusion. We know that um, that's very important for our community and for our students. Um, and so we are working on protocols to ensure safety of our students as they are changing from setting to setting within their learning environment. And we also are making sure we have protocols in place to continue small group instruction. We have several um, things that are happening right now. Um, through ESY, we are piloting some schedules, some structured schedules. I know Dr. Bentz talked about that earlier, but we'll have some structured schedules in place for students that are participating virtually so that they have um, a structured day to um, provide continuity within their learning. We are also providing some summer special ed evaluations um, with some of our students. And with that, we're piloting some personal protective equipment um, to make sure that we um, have the best materials in place to keep everybody safe. And um, we have some clear masks that we're piloting so that students can see our faces. We are, um, that's gonna be important for some of our students that are deaf or hard of hearing or receive speech therapy. Um, and so we're also piloting using plexiglass within our small group instruction. And um, so lots of things in place to ensure the safety of our staff and students. We will also make sure that there are routines within our classrooms that are practiced and taught um, to include social distancing and proper hygiene, um, hand washing, we know we're going to need the use of visual schedules, social stories, um, power cards, and reminders as our students are learning their new normal um, at school. Thanks, Corey. Hey, Kimberly. Um, we have this slide that shows you a little bit of where we've been and where we're going, um, but actually the thing that I'm going to have our next presenter, who's executive director for instructional professional learning, um, Susan Cole, um, is a very important step that gets us um, to before, uh, that'll actually happen after the timeline here. Um, so after July 17th, and, and that's an important date because that's the day after our board meeting next week. So on July 16th, we'll be um, talking to our board with a refined plan um, for the opening of school, um, barring any significant changes as we know that um, the world keeps turning and the world keeps changing every day, um, especially as we relate, as it relates to this global pandemic. Um, but Susan, we have a lot of learning to continue um, as we gear up for the start of the school year. What can you share with our families about what our teachers are doing, how they're getting, how they're going to be getting ready, um, and, and what are the what's the learning look like for our staff as we gear up for 2020-21? Thank you, Corey. 
Um, and as Corey mentioned, this visual really shows the path and the steps we've been taking over the past couple of months, but we know there's a lot of work still to be done. And so we are uh, working with our teaching and learning team, which includes our special programs team, pathways and innovation curriculum team, to really look at what exactly would be the best supports to give our teachers. Here in Leander, we pride ourselves for the high quality learning that we're able to provide to our adults in our system. And so now as this moves forward, there's already lots of great things happening this summer, but how can we make sure that we're providing the support needed for those teachers that we'll be teaching um, in a virtual way? And so that will include things like uh, content support with curriculum, assessment strategies, the best instructional strategies and tools to use, and one of the most important things that I know several people have talked about today is how to connect with your students in a virtual way and build those strong relationships because that is that is key. So I'm excited about the work that we're doing. Uh, and again, lots of work to be done. And um, we'll have these sessions offered and um, we'll be able to record some of those via Zoom. So then people can also listen to those asynchronously in our system. Um, so anyway, just a quick, preview of our virtual teaching academy that will be held uh, late July. Thank you. All right, thank you, Susan. Thank you to our presenters. And we're gonna dive into some questions. Let me pull up my screen. All right, again, if you can please use the Q&A tool. Um, we also have um, Isabel, our translator, although I can't translate this into Spanish to let the people who need it know, but we are responding um, in the chat to questions in Spanish. Um, our first question is coming about extracurriculars um, like theater, choir, and band. As we mentioned in the slides, um, we are offering all of those programs and um, for, every, for every student. So if you choose to have your student um, learn virtually, they'll have the opportunity to participate in in those enrichment programs or those those clubs, those teams, those performance groups, they'll have to do that part in person. Um, we have our assistant superintendent of Pathways and Innovation, Krista Carlene. Um, do you wanna talk a little bit more about um, CTE programs and what that could look like for next year, Krista? Sure, thank you, Corey, and welcome Leander ISD. Um, TEA has released a list of courses, of CTE courses, that would require some face-to-face -face time in order to be able to meet the level of the standards in those, that particular course. What we are currently doing as a district is we are reviewing those courses as well as additional courses in those programs to be able to provide our families a list of courses that could be um, taught 100% uh, virtually and those that will require you to come into campus. Um, TEA is allowing districts to determine um, how often a student would need to come into campus in order to fulfill the TEKS uh, for those particular courses. And so we have a team who is working on that list. So as uh, families make a decision of whether or not to go virtual or face-to-face, -face, they have all the information they need, and then they will be able to speak with counselors about what adjustments to their schedule they might need to make um, if they decide to go virtual. Um, that list should be coming out next week. Thank you, Krista. Um, we have a question that's got lots of depth to it, and I, I think some of these were already answered, so I'm just gonna pick through um, to uh, parts of this next one that I think are, have, have not been answered um, to the depth that the, the question is being asked. Um, and it's, it's related to contact tracing, Kristen, and health. Um, what's that notification gonna look like for parents uh, and if they're going to be notified for quarantining? Um, and then there's a question about testing students we talked about and um, in, in any insurement of asymptomatic spreaders. Um, what would you say, um, Kristen, to parents who are, who are wanting to know about that notification process if their child does come into contact um, with somebody in our schools that had a positive um, COVID case. Um, and and what, it, what does it look like? We know it's a community honor system um, of self-reporting, um, but anything else you can share, Kristen? Sure. For the daily contact tracing that will go on, if an individual needs to be notified, they will get a phone call from either campus administration 
the campus nurse or someone on the district COVID team to let them know that their student may have come in contact with this and look talk through detailed what the process is. Um, have resources and references if they choose they'd like to be tested. Um, I see their primary, primary care physician will have a lot of support during that phone call. Um, yes, self-screening self is what we're aiming towards right now for our students will be self-screened before they leave their home, before they enter on the school bus or enter the campus. If at any time when they are on campus or arrive at campus and there's any concern or they're exhibiting any symptoms, they will be brought to the campus nurse and assessed appropriately and parents will be contacted. Chris, and during flu season, we know that our campus nurses work really close with our custodians and our, our, um, our building crews about sanitation. Um, what would you say um, to parents who have questions about sanitation processes and making sure that we keep our schools clean, especially after a, a reported positive case? Correct, correct. So we work, like, like you said, we work really, we work really close with our custodial team. Um, we have a direct line to them. And when we have any type of concern um, with any type of communicable disease or viral spreading, we reach out to them and coordinate how that needs to be taken care of whether that's when the kids are out of that classroom, they go in and sanitize the room before they come back. It's all just gonna be case by case by um, case by case situations. But like I said, we have a really good relationship with them and we'll be arranging that as needed throughout the day. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you to our nurses and anyone out there in our, our, our health community, our healthcare community. Um, we know that y'all have been heroes on the on the front lines of this. We appreciate you greatly. Um, Bruce, we have a question about star testing. Um, we had a, which I know is one of your favorite topics. Um, we had a, um, as you saw in the slide earlier, the, the state has decided to do um, and continue star testing. Do you wanna share a little bit more about this? Specifically, this person is asking about um, an effort to um, request the TEA um, and Commissioner Marath uh, waive star testing again this year as they did last year. Um, what would you like to share to parents uh, who are concerned about state testing? Yes, thank you, Corey. Um, this is one of the things that the TEA put out very early on in this process that uh, star testing will return uh, in 2020, 2021, um, and that a full accountability for schools will return as well. Um, a group of Central Texas superintendents has already submitted a letter to TEA early on in this process indicating um, our uh, opposition to the fact that testing is coming back in these very challenging times. Um, what we requested was for not so much not to test, but for us to um, not have that count towards accountability in this, in this year again, like they did last year. Um, so we've already made that request. Um, we'll continue to pursue avenues with, with TEA. We're in constant uh, connection with the commissioner and we continue to try to provide suggestions on things that will work well for our schools. At this time, however, um, we will be following um, what TEA guidance is given to us. And so we will be preparing for testing. Of course, academic achievement of our students is a priority in all of this process still. And we'll continue to make sure that we're developing each and every child. Um, strongly academically as well as socially and emotionally and physically uh, to the best of our ability. So we'll continue to work on those issues as we move forward. Thank you, Bruce. Um, we have a, a, a row of questions here about social distancing um, in classrooms and on buses um, and maintaining class sizes that all, that all go together. Um, Devin um, shared earlier um, the the decision by TEA to require um, schools to offer a 100% in-person option and a 100% virtual option um, makes it difficult for us to maintain, um, if not impossible, to maintain a six feet um, social distancing um, configuration. That's why we were focused so much on that 50-50 model uh, of blended um, was to be able to create opportunities to spread out. Um, but with that mandate to do the 100% in-person option um, for every family, that makes it hard. And in our survey, we did um, see about 50% of families um, say that they want 100% in-person learning and about 25% say they want virtual empowered learning. 
um, at that point in time. Granted, a lot has changed in the last two weeks. Um, Dr. Pataville, you, you know, working with the school leadership teams, what can you say about social distancing, um, what that'll look like, how, how we're going to be able to manage that, at, if at all, um, and on, on buses and what parents can expect? No, Corey, that's a critical question there. So after we get enrollment information throughout the month of July, or as we get it, we are working with campus leaders and district facility staff, and we are doing classroom reviews, building reviews, and even looking at transportation routes. And the goal is to make sure that in every space, we have the greatest extent of social distancing possible. And that's also tied to one of the reasons why we are, especially for our secondary students, requiring facial coverings in our school is to protect the health and safety of our kids when so many of them go to um, our schools. Our schools are mid to large sized here. And so we need to make sure that we, we do protect them. What this looks like is in, in our buses, there will be strict cleaning protocols. There'll be sit, strict seat assignments when we know the exact numbers of who is on those buses. And then um, as well in our classrooms, we are looking at changing furniture arrangements and even looking at alternative spaces for classrooms if it means that we can have a greater degree of social distancing. Corey, if I can jump in there for a second, um, I, just, I just wanna add that, you know, we're gonna do the best that we can with the circumstances that we find ourselves in. With the mandates that we're getting from agencies above us, we, we're, we have constraints handed to us that are not necessarily ideal in our eyes. Um, I wanna stress that the safety of our children is our priority, but we can only do that inside the constraints that we have. And so we urge you to really consider carefully um, how well you feel about the safety of your children, um, knowing what you know at the time you make that decision. Um, the TEA has also pushed that decision point very late, so they've allowed for you to give us an indication of what you might choose so that we can plan, but you'll be able to change your mind up until two weeks before the start of school when you'll know as much information as possible. So we do urge you to do what you believe in your heart is right for your children because that's, that's the most important thing to us. We are public school. If you send your students to us, we're gonna protect them and teach them and love on them as best we can um, with the constraints that we have but we want you to also know that we do have those constraints depending on how many students show up for school. Thank you, Bruce. Um, and Devin, we, we know that all of our schools are all shape, different shape sizes. You know, I keep mentioning, because I guess because I got the, the field behind me and it's on my mind about um, graduation here. Vandergrift is our biggest school and it has, uh, what a thousand more students than our smallest high school um, we have a question in the chat about um, just the general logistics in a school of changing classes particularly at secondary um, getting in and out of the cafeteria um, this question specific to styles but we know many of our schools are are quite large what have those discussions been and how is that going to look like um, from a campus level decision making and procedure um, process Devin? So Corey, was that question mostly about transitions in a large school? Yeah, it's about, you know, we've talked, I know you've talked a lot about with the principals, given that every school looks different, has different configurations, different student bodies, and, and more or less students. We know that um, campuses are going to have to lead a lot of these logistical decisions. Um, so this particular question is about overcrowded campuses, but I thought maybe you could share some um, not only about overcrowded, but just how our principals are 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 leading this this effort in in our in our buildings. Yeah, so principals already just started the first step in making sure that we're designing transitions and classroom to classroom changes in such a way that limits the crowding in our schools as much as possible. Now, I do want to be very straightforward about that. What that is going to incur is in some cases a loss of instructional time. We're talking about dismissing classes at different times, um, dismissing hallways at different times, in order to make sure that we're able to protect the health and safety of our students. In addition to that, the numbers of families that sign up for virtual learning will help us determine 
how those structures look as well. And so throughout this month of July, as parents make their choice, we will be able to make um, more definitive decisions about campus safety as it relates to crowding in our classrooms, in our hallways, and um, you know, even in large settings like the cafeteria. Thank you, Devin. Um, we got another academic question, and this one's gonna go to, again, Krista, who's our assistant superintendent um, over Pathways and Innovation. It's about pre-AP and AP classes. Um, Krista, what is that gonna look like um, as a, and the virtual option? Um, will they continue to be offered? And I think we could probably go ahead and throw in um, IB and pre-IB in this discussion as well, and maybe even talk about dual credit, because we know that this being targeted to secondary families, we know that those are all issues at the top of people's minds. And what are, what are some of those, what are some of those programs going to look like? So it is our um, goal that we'll be able to offer all of those um, both virtually and face-to-face. -face. We do have a team that is reviewing some of the um, requirements for some specifically our lab-based courses that are AP and the required labs that go along with that curriculum to be able to determine um, if the people will need to be able will need to come in to complete some of those labs in a face-to-face -face setting. Um, our uh, dual credit courses right now will be held online. And so we'll be working with ACC as those are going to be held online. But we are looking and working with our partners as best we can to make sure that uh, students who are both in a face-to-face -face setting and a virtual setting will have access to those courses. Thank you, Krista. Got to go back to Bruce here for this question. Um, and it's about, and, and Bruce, you had mentioned the start of the school year um, and that August 13th date in our approved calendar, um, but there's still a question about pushing it back. Um, there's the recent TEA ruling about the, the three week grace period option. What would you like to share? I know you shared a little bit already, but um, in, in regards to questions about start of school, and maybe if you can talk a little bit more about that three week grace period um, program. Yeah, so what TEA has allowed us to do is um, have uh, this three week grace period where um, we don't have to bring all students back um, in person all at the same time. So the only caveat in that is that any student who um, requires technology, um, so in other words, doesn't have access to the technology at home to get the full virtual learning, can attend school in person. They must be allowed to attend school in person. So one example could be at the middle school level, we could in week one, just allow all sixth graders to come back. Um, and in week two, bring seventh graders. And then in week three, eighth graders. Um, the benefits of that would be, you know, the ability to get new students to a campus acclimatized to that campus, you know, in these unique circumstances, it would allow us to work out some of the kinks um, and learn from you know, that experience with a smaller number of students before we bring everybody back. Um, but we're still in conversation about how to make that work or not work. Uh, there have been some developments as late as this afternoon um, in El Paso County that lead us to believe that some county governments are starting to take action with regard to the start of school. Um, and so you know, we're continuing to watch that very carefully. Um, and we'll continue those conversations as soon as we know more information about any decisions about how, who and how we will do the start of school, we'll be making those announcements to the public. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I'm going to call on somebody that we haven't heard from yet, and that's um, Jennifer Collins, who is our assistant superintendent of curriculum. Um, Jennifer, we're getting a lot of questions about virtual classes, about um, virtual class sizes, um, about what a typical day will look like virtual. Dr. Benz did a good job of giving a, an overview, um, but as we get closer, I think people are wanting a more tangible, you know, feel and touch to what virtual, which is a little ironic, we're talking about virtual learning, but totally get it when we're all trying to make these tough decisions for our kids. Um, any more details you can give parents about what virtual learning will touch and feel and look like? So we are going to try, Corey, to align our middle school and high school students on a schedule that looks as similar as possible to a face-to-face -face schedule. So we do anticipate class periods throughout the course of the day. Um, we do anticipate that our high school students would likely be on 
be kind of scheduled, just like our high school students who are learning um, face to face. Um, and then there will be times in each of those class periods for students to interact with the teacher in um, live ways, you know, using some virtual methods, as well as some time for students to do some practicing or working on projects independently or with peers in that classroom setting. So we are going to try as much as possible to be able to mimic what would uh, students would be experiencing in the classroom. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I apologize, we're not ducking. There's a question about the HVAC systems. I was hoping to try to track down an answer um, um, about the HVAC systems. Uh, we don't unfortunately have Jimmy Disler um, here today or anyone from our facilities office, but we'll make sure that we put that in an FAQ. I do wanna take this time um, to let everybody know uh, this won't be the last time you hear from us um, as we gear up for the start of the school year. This seems to be a popular format. We have um, almost 4,000 people watching today. Um, we had um, close to 15 or 17,000 people or so watching yesterday. So we'll continue to be visible here um, and, and up front and answering questions as we gear with that. So I apologize for not having an answer um, to the question about um, HVAC systems. I don't see any of my panelists jumping jumping to talk about HVAC. Um, Bruce, I did hear you talk in one of the other webinars about the, this question. And um, this, this person asks, how do we rely on the honor system with self-screening during a pandemic? Um, what would, with just how we know, with what we're all facing right now, um, what would you like to, what would you share, Bruce, with people who are just concerned about the community aspect of, of public schools and in, in, in coming together um, in our learning environments? I think it's absolutely critically important that um, we understand and try to pull together as a community as, as we address these very challenging times. Um, we do have to rely on people to be honest and transparent about their children and about themselves um, be, because there's no other way for us to do that. Um, we know that there, there are cases of, of folks who give their children Tylenol to reduce their fevers when they have flu or some other ailment and send them to school. Um, we do understand and are empathetic with the fact that some people have circumstances that we don't necessarily understand, but we do urge everybody to please pull together with us on this as we work together to try to keep all of the members of our community safe. Um, the, the problem with this virus is that it affects people that we can't see or touch um, in ways that we don't know. And so we have to take every precaution at every moment in order to prevent the spread of it and to protect our children, our children's families, and that includes extended families, um, as well as our staff and our faculty. I want to just take this opportunity to thank um, the administrative team and the work that they're doing. Um, they're working almost 24 seven as this virus continues and our circumstances continue to shift and change. Um, I want to especially thank our board of trustees for the work that they're doing, not only in public board meetings, but also um, behind the scenes. Um, they are doing exceptional work to guide the vision of the district and to make sure that as we open school, we have the health and safety of our students and our faculty that is now number one priority, that we have the social and emotional needs of our um, employees and our students um, as a very close second, and that we still continue to focus on producing an excellent academic education for everybody involved um, as, as we progress into the start of, of the 2021 school year. Thank you, Bruce. Apologize, I cut out there for a minute. I hope, I'm glad the webinar stayed up because I was a little worried when I lost my internet signal. Okay, we're, we're, we're closing, coming to a close. Many of our team needs to get back um, and get ready for, um, get ready for graduation here behind me. Um, please know, again, this is not the last time you're gonna hear from us or see us um, in this fashion. Um, we're going to be as visible as possible because we know that um, in your hearts and minds, this is one of the toughest times, if not the toughest time 
um, that we're facing as a community, as parents, as teachers, educators, and, and we're all in this together. Um, Bruce, any, any closing thoughts? I know you just shared, shared a lot, but anything that you'd also like our, our families to know before we wrap up uh, today? Absolutely. I just want you to know um, that we have over 400 questions in just today's webinar. We've had hundreds and um, close to thousands more in the webinars that we've put on before. We're also getting a lot of email messages. We read and listen to every one of those messages. We may not respond individually, but we are compiling frequently asked questions and trying to gather those together. Um, your input is absolutely critical to us. We are gathering great ideas from the questions and the comments that have been posted and that are asked. Um, and that will help us to do a better job serving you and serving your children as we go into the school year. So we encourage you to keep helping us, be patient with us. We're far from perfect, um, but we're doing the very best that we can in the circumstances that we have. Together we can uh, serve our students and give them the excellent education that they deserve despite the circumstances. So thank you everybody. Uh, we look forward to a great graduation tonight for Vandergrift High School um, and then four more graduations coming in the next couple of days. So we do want to wish our class of 2020 all the best as they head into their new adventure. Thank you for listening. Thank you for taking your time with us and have a great evening. Thank you everyone. Thank you to our panelists. Everyone have a great night.